Well, hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, part uh, four of our installment of reading uh, Martin Booth's Cannabis of History. And, uh, copyright 2004. But very good. Still very uh, prescient and, uh, you know, it's a history book, so... Uh, a lot most of it doesn't go out of date very quick <laughs> or at all so part three uh chapter three this is part four now well, we're on chapter three at the very beginning of chapter three and i've done my camera a little different this time so where you can see a little more of me a different angle hopefully you you like that <laughs> see how it goes can't really see my bird as much over here but <laughs> You know, there's another bird, so the similar but not the same up above it. Over <laughs> anyway, uh, can't really pan the camera right now. I'll show you some other time. So, uh, all right, getting to it. Okay, all right. Cannabis sativa almost certainly grew in Western Europe before the Scythian invasion. Okay, side in. Although it is unknown how widespread it was and not much is understood about its use by primitive man. Hemp seeds have been discovered in a number of Neolithic sites across Western Europe from Eisenberg, 50 miles southwest of Leipzig in Germany to Frumusita in the Danube River Valley system on the Romanian-Ukrainian border. This would place hemp use in Europe as being contemporary with its first discovery in China. But this uh, is supposition, and whereas the Chinese were cultivating it, there is no proof that Europeans were doing likewise. But of course, this is a history book that can, that can change that part. We might find evidence, you know. Furthermore, these discoveries have prompted the speculation that early Europeans were using hemp for shamanistic purposes, that is, as a drug. Yet the chance of cannabis plants so far north producing sufficient quantities of resin, even assuming a major climate shift, make this theory exceedingly slim indeed. The first solid evidence of the presence of hemp use comes from a 5th century BC funerary urn discovered at Wilmersdorf in 1896 by the German archaeologist Hermann Buss, or Buss, since when a number of other finds have been made. Whether the hemp was locally grown or imported by the Scythians cannot be verified, nor can the purpose of its use, although being associated with burial suggests a religious connotation. It was with the expansion of the Roman Empire that hemp and its cultivation became commonplace. Probably the earliest piece of many Roman hemp rope fragments found in Britain was discovered as far north as the Roman fort on the Antonine Wall at Bar Hill between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Built around AD 80, the fort was initially occupied by the first cohort of Batesians or Batesians, formed of men from the Batesi tribe uh, or Batazi tribe from the area of Germany between the rivers Meuse and Rhine. Being Roman infantry and from the center of Europe, they more than likely brought the rope with them. What this shows, however, was that hemp stretched to the very edges of the empire for Except for the occasional military incursion into Scotland, the Romans did not venture beyond the Antonine Wall. As the Roman Empire began to fade, and after its fall, the need for domestic supplies of hemp in the former countries of Roman occupation arose to replace the imports the occupiers had brought in. At the same time, the Franks, a western Germanic people, thought to have originated from Pomerania on the Baltic Sea coast, began to spread across Roman Europe. 
They were eventually to settle most of the Roman province of Gaul, roughly the area of modern France and Belgium, as well as conquering much of Germany and moving into Italy. Agriculturally more advanced than the Romans, they invented the three-field crop rotation system. Hmm. One of their crops was hemp, grown for its fiber. When tombs in the crypt of the Cathedral of St. Denis in northern Paris, St. Denis in northern, Denis, northern Paris were opened in the early 1960s, the body of the Frankish queen Arnegund, consort and second wife of Clothar I, who died in the mid-6th century AD, was discovered, adorned in jewelry and attired in silk and linen. Her corpse was protected by a blanket of hemp cloth. So, you had silk, linen, hemp cloth. There you go. About AD 400, the cultivation of hemp reached Britain. The first recorded growing of hemp with flax was at Old Buckingham, 15 miles southwest of Norwich. By 600, with the arrival of the Saxons, hemp growing was well established. At about the same time, the Vikings extensively used hemp, samples of hemp and rope, fishing line, and sailcloth having been found in Britain and Iceland, prompting the theory that the Vikings who purportedly discovered North America, may have introduced the plant to the New World. By the ninth century, ocean, I think it was probably already here, but anyway, another thing. <laughs> By the ninth century, ocean-going Arab Dows were trading as far east as Indochina, and it was inevitable that they would, sooner or later, discover what the Chinese had been doing with hemp for centuries making paper. When the Arabs extended their conquest to the western Mediterranean, occupying southern Spain, they took the technology of paper making with them. Okay, so the Arabs, you know, the Moors, the Moorish invasion of the Iberia Peninsula. Okay, <laughs> so the idea is they took it with them. Uh, da, 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 da. The first paper factory in Europe began producing about 1150 in Jativa, 50 miles north of Alicante, using locally grown hemp. Other paper mills followed in Valencia and Toledo. The Arabs kept a tight monopoly on the manufacturing process, but as Arab influence in Spain began to decline in the 14th century, the knowledge of paper making escaped and spread across Western Europe. Hemp, until then predominantly used as a fiber for cloth and rope, went through a minor uh, revival. At about the same time as paper started to become more widely available, movable type printing was invented. Johann Gutenberg first pr printed the Bible on hemp and rag paper in Mainz, around 1456. The paper made with the same process as the Chinese had been using for a thousand years. His printing was based upon the Chinese use of wood blocks. Mm -hmm. Although a number of varieties of hemp were known in Europe, they were not extensively cultivated. Crops tended to be grown only for the immediate domestic market and there was little trade in the fibers. This changed in the Middle Ages in Italy, where cultivation on a grand scale commenced, accelerated by the Renaissance. There was a sound reason for this, the need for ships' cordage and sails, I'll add. Uh, no better material for sails. Uh, no, I would say no better natural material on earth for sails than hemp done you know woven and done in the hemp cloth done in the right way nothing better and 
Only a, only a very few synthetic materials can rival it, even now. Um, so, yeah, cordage and cells. The city states of Italy survived on maritime trade, the most powerful of them being Venice. Famed for its, uh, famed for its merchants and shipbuilders, it had risen to prominence using imported hemp. This left it vulnerable to supply. A competitor or enemy had only to cut off supply or, worse, raise the price to bring the Venetian merchant fleet to a standstill. Consequently, the Venetians founded their own hemp industry operated through a state-owned factory called the Tana, or Tana. Situated in the arsenal, the hemp was redded there. The fibers twisted by cord winders into rope or woven by sail makers. A guild of hemp workers was established and statutes insisted on all vessels using Venetian rope. <laughs> Quality control in the Tana was very strict. Fines being imposed for substandard work. The result was that Venetian rope was considered amongst the best in the world for three centuries. The Venetian merchant fleet controlled Mediterranean trade and its warships were the most feared throughout the region until the city finally fell to Napoleon in 1797. After the demise of Venice, however, the growing of Italian hemp continued apace. Within 50 years, Italy was exporting hemp to England, Portugal, Germany, Spain, and Switzerland. Techniques in fiber processing had so advanced that hemp was being spun into yarn almost as fine as silk, but stronger than cotton, which was much in demand for expensive fabrics. Outside the sphere of the Mediterranean, four other nations vied for maritime power the English, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the Dutch. A need to trade with the Far East and the African seaboard without going overland, not to mention exploration to the West in order to find a route to the Indies, meant building sturdy seagoing vessels. As ship design improved, sail technology developed, one of the most important of the innovations being the adoption in the early 15th century of the jib and lateen. Triangular sails first invented in the 9th century and used by the Arabs in their ocean going dows, which permitted ships to sail to windward towards the wind, you know, towards the wind. Uh, long-distance sea travel, in which the Venetians had not indulged, now became a real possibility. One problem of this kind of sail, however, was its need to be very durable and tear-resistant, for it was subjected to considerable strain. Hemp gave it the necessary qualities. Mm -hmm. It was the Dutch who spearheaded the development of hemp, Using the power of windmills, which were driven by hemp sails, hmm. <laughs> they were able to streamline the labor-intensive fiber extraction process to such an extent their production outstripped domestic hemp supplies. The country simply was not big enough to grow the hemp required, <laughs> so they were, they were they, they, it's like they perfected the production, right? It's needed the supply, <laughs> the raw thing that's something so consequently the dutch were forced to import from scandinavia the baltic states russia and even italy which they were trying to oust as a maritime nation <laughs> they were competing with them seeing the dutch in ascendancy the english followed suit hmm, building a merchant fleet and a navy for its defense Yet they, too, faced the same supply problems as the Dutch. They needed that hemp, didn't they? <laughs> England being an island meant its resources were finite, 
and both shipbuilding timber and hemp had to be imported. It has been estimated that it took 80 tons of hemp to rig a Tudor man of war. <laughs> At the time, an acre of hemp could produce on average 18 pounds of dressed fiber. The fleet that drove off the Spanish Armada in 1588, consisting of 34 ships of the line and 163 smaller vessels, had therefore required the output of about 10,000 acres of hemp. Mm. That's not a small amount. King Henry VIII, the founder of the English Navy, realizing the strategic importance of hemp, issued a royal proclamation in 1533, which levied a fine of 3S4D, not sure what that, on any farmer, not sure what that is. It's a fine in the currency of the day. On any a farmer who, who refused to put a portion of his arable land under hemp or flax. The rate of cultivation commanded was a quarter of an acre for every 60 acres. The farmers were not pleased. Uh, hemp did not return a good price and it was believed the plant impoverished the soil by sucking out the nutrients. Well, it doesn't, but they believe that. And they didn't want to grow it. They, they wanted to grow other things. The labor required to rent the fibers, not to mention the smell as the plant rotted, which was, as were most foul odors at the time, considered a source of disease. <laughs> disease, they said, only fueled their determination to resist. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely not true. 30 years later, Elizabeth I increased the fine to 5S, but without effect. The decree being repealed in 1593. So, that didn't stick, you know. The defeat of the Spanish Armada established England as the primary European maritime power. Consequently, the need for hemp increased further and even had the English farmers been willing, they would have been hard-pressed to meet the demand. Importation was essential, with English vessels visiting Danzig, Riga, and St. Petersburg for their cargoes. At the time, Russia was the world's major hemp producer, and by 1633, Russian hemp merchants were providing well over 90% of England's raw hemp requirement. Such reliance upon a foreign producer not only all but killed off the English hemp trade, but at, as the Venetians had discovered, it also left the country vulnerable. There was only one answer to the problem. Britain had to turn to its fledgling colonies in the New World for supply. <laughs> Britain was not the first nation to look across the Atlantic to feed the demand for hemp. Since the middle of the 16th century, the Spanish had been attempting to grow hemp in their settlements in Mexico, Peru, Colombia, and Chile. It is thought hemp was brought to Mexico by Pedro Cuadrado, a conquistador serving with Cortez. The plant was successfully introduced, but in 1550, the Spanish governor reduced production. Native laborers had discovered that hemp growing in the tropics, where the temperatures were high and the days long, contained a drug. <laughs> and he was fearful that this might lead to rebellion or a degradation of the workforce. <laughs> Only in Chile was hemp a viable commercial success. As early, uh, and that might have a lot to do with the altitude of Chile. It was up in the mountains, you know, it was higher up, which kind of is, debunks what he just said. <laughs> because, uh, like he said earlier on, if you're paying attention in the book, that at higher altitudes, you know, cannabis is more potent. So, Chile is at higher altitudes. So even though hemp production was a success there, they also probably had plenty of the drug <laughs> part as well. 
it just happened to be a success maybe for other reasons and and probably unsuccessful for other reasons in the other parts of South America. So just take certain things with a grain, just like any history book. <laughs> anyway, still good though, okay? <laughs> All right, where were we? Okay, okay, Farm Bruiser. Oh. I have lost my... Okay. It is through hemp. Okay. A quandary exists. Oh, wait. I'm not wasn't there. <laughs> okay. Try it for you, Chile. As early as 1545, it was being uh, farmed near Santiago almost exclusively for rope making. Hmm. Presumably, the Chilean natives, unlike those in Mexico, had no need of hemp as a drug because they already used coca leaves. Well, again, very subjective, very debatable, you know, hypothetical, theoretical. And uh, shoot, if anything, maybe the coca leaves and the cannabis were being used by the Chileans. They had access to both, right? That, that makes more sense to me. Anyway, <laughs> a quandary exists over when hemp reached North America. Okay. The Vikings may have introduced it centuries before Columbus discovered the continent. Alternatively, it could have been spread to the West Coast by Chinese explorers. <laughs> you know, they were said to have sailed around the northern Pacific. It could have also been carried across the Bering Strait by birds or even by animals when Asia and America were joined by a land bridge. In other words, we really don't freaking know when cannabis hemp made it to North, North America or South America. Okay. Hmm. Evidence for there being hemp in North America, prior to the arrival of the white man, is said to come from clay pipes wrapped in hemp cloth and containing, containing cannabis residue excavated from the famous Death Mask Mound just outside Chillicothe, Ohio. This, however, is highly suspect. Though citing this as proof, date the mound to 400 BC. But the mound builder, or late woodland culture, is dated to around 80, 1300. Well, that has been a bit revised lately. Now, if you notice, when you look at these types of things online, they'll have a, a big window, you know? Yeah, dated to around 18, 1300 at the latest. And at the earliest, they keep pushing back the earliest on these mounds. <laughs> and back to about 400 BC in some cases, some mounds. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Another grain of salt there. <laughs> uh, what is more, doubt exists about the pipes having been wrapped in cloth in the first place, not to mention containing cannabis residues. Giovanni da Verrazzano the Florentine adventurer who discovered New York Harbor and was a member of a French expedition to Virginia in 1542 reported seeing natives dressed in a clothing of leaves sewn with hemp. The French explorer Jacques Cartier also wrote of seeing wild hemp growing in Canada between 1535 and 1541. Whilst George Grogan Krogan, sorry, traveling down the Ohio River by canoe in May 1785, wrote in his journal, 18th and 19th, we traveled through a prodigious, prodigious large meadow called the Pyankesha's Hunting Ground, overgrown with wild hemp, adding three days later, wild hemp grows here in abundance. Okay. What they assumed was cannabis sativa, however, was more likely to have been Acnita cannabinum, the American water hemp, 
or Apocinum cannabinum, also known as Indian hemp, both of which produce fibers and were used by the indigenous people medicinally and for fiber. <laughs> so, yeah, they had other things like hemp. That doesn't mean that hemp wasn't here before. Right, there could be a, a plethora, <laughs> you know. Okay. First known experimental planting of cannabis sativa was in 1606 in Nova Scotia. Huh, that's funny. That's where the trailer park boys show is. <laughs> I immediately think of them when I think of Nova Scotia, Canada. So that's funny. They, they, they probably like to know that. <laughs> it was carried out by Louis Habert, apothecary to Samuel de Champlain, the French explorer and founder of Quebec. The early French and British colonists in the New World wanted to cultivate food crops. Not only did they need these for their survival, but they were loath to plant hemp for the same reasons as farmers back in Europe. However, <clears throat> their masters back home demanded they produce hemp. <laughs> they still kind of like a feudalism uh, was in place. And it just spread over to the New World and the colonies. Uh, so, however, their master's back home. Yeah, you better produce some hemp for us in our boats. Right? In Quebec, Jean Talon, or Jean Talon, King Louis XIV's personal representative, had to resort to desperate measures to get the Quebecois to toe the line. In November 1666, he reported back to his superior in France, I have found that to encourage the inhabitants to grow a great deal of hemp, it was necessary to induce in them a want of thread. To this end, I seized all the thread I could find here, and I will only dis distribute it to those who agree to return a stated quantity of hemp. <laughs> everybody's thread. <laughs> That's hilarious. In the English colonies, hemp and flax cultivation was mandatory from 1611 by order of King James I. Settlers at Jamestown preferred to grow more lucrative tobacco, but cultivated hemp under a contract signed with the Virginia Company in 1607, just prior to the founding of the colony. In fact, Hemp was to save many of them from bankruptcy. When the tobacco market slumped, as it did periodically, hemp kept the farmer's cash flow going. It was more stable. However, to ensure the steady production of hemp, the Virginia Company issued an order in 1619 that every colonist had to raise 100 hemp plants. <laughs> the governor personally agreed to raise 5,000. Later the same year, a budget of 10 guineas per man was set aside to encourage hemp dressers from Scandinavia and Poland to immigrate to Virginia. Hmm. To further promote hemp growing, colonial legal tender laws were enacted making taxes payable in flax, tar, and hemp. In 1682, Virginia made hemp legal tender in the paying off of up to a quarter of a farmer's debts. <laughs> Subsequently, hemp production rose in Maryland and Virginia, but little of the harvest reached Britain. New England merchants purchased most of it as hemp, as hemp was scarce on the northeastern seaboard, uh, especially since shipbuilding was beginning to become a major industry. American hemp was of high quality, making good twine and rope, and by 1630, clothed half the population every winter, and most of it in the summer. To meet demand and reduce imports, 
The General Assembly of Connecticut, sitting in Hartford in 1637, ordered all families to plant one teaspoonful of hemp seed. Massachusetts followed this example two years later. <laughs> It was in Salem, Massachusetts in 1635 that the first rope walk was erected in America. A rope walk was a long, narrow building up to 1,300 feet in length in which ropes were made. Boston soon entered in competition, uh, bringing a rope maker called John Harrison over from England in 1642, presenting him with a guaranteed life monopoly in the city. Thereafter, rope walks were built up and down the length of Eastern America. See, an industry that has been completely forgotten. Isn't that something? 1,300 feet long buildings <laughs> in major cities. That's pretty major, okay? <laughs> That's... <laughs> You don't have that anymore in Boston or anywhere else. 1,300 feet? My goodness. <laughs> well, it's more than a fifth of a mile. It's almost a quarter mile. I would, yeah, my math's not great, but it's close. <laughs> That's, yeah major major stuff here and I'm gonna end it there because we're at that point and I got my pencil and I'm gonna mark where we were um, so up and down the length of Eastern America those rope walks they were called rope walks so it was like a factory of a sort to make ropes and they the building needed to be probably like a continuous room <laughs> long you know a, a long length and uh you know the the width probably not nearly as important so wow <laughs> something else huh a lot of info there and i hope you liked it and we're i tell you we're two and a half well yeah so two and a half three pages to the next chapter that will be chapter four and I give you a sneak peek of the chapter name. It's called The Shrub of Emotion. The Morsel of Thought. <laughs> so yeah, next chapter is going to be a little different. <laughs> Each one is. But this one we're on, it's called A Fiber for All Seasons. And we still got about half a, a well, you know, less, maybe a quarter of it left. Okay. So I hope you liked it, and I'll keep my comments to a minimum tonight So <laughs> for this video to keep it shorter. And I hope you all enjoyed, and I hope that you all watch the next one, and we'll keep going. Eventually, I'm going to read the whole book. So, not sure how long, but <laughs> it'll take, but it, we're going to do it. So, good night. Y'all have a good evening and good night.